wow, this is a great yoga class, but I'm really kind of distracted by this woman on the next mat. I can sense her panic because she can't do the poses as well as I can. Now I sense that her panic is turning into anger and resentment at my yoga awesomeness. And, you know, that is such an intrusion for me. Yoga is my safe space. And now I have to deal with the vibes from this woman and her baggage and her envy. Um, excuse me. Yes? I was just wondering if you knew there's a big chili stain on the back of your Lululemon pants. Is that why you were staring at me? Well, I was also wondering if you knew those are the kind of Lululemon pants everybody can see through. You know, the ones they recalled. So you weren't resenting my awesomeness? <laughs> Did you have to ask that right when I was drinking out of my sustainable water bottle? Today on The Nose, the crisis in Yoga Town. Also, is anxiety the new depression? And now the inventor of the downward-licking dog, Colin McEnroe. Actually, the fun of this morning was that I uh, I got to demonstrate to Betsy Kaplan, who's the other voice on that intro, how to do a spit take, um, which I, I attended classes with Danny Thomas very early in my career. Um, all right, so I think Danny Thomas did invent the spit take, but I could be wrong. Email me if you think I'm wrong. All right, so it's time for the news. Our guests today are a writer and critic, Rand Cooper, uh, and uh, Professor Irene Papoulos of Trinity College, and um, actor, uh, blogger, comedian, dance impresario, I don't know what else, Carolyn Payne. Uh, and we are going to begin. Uh, we'll, I'll tell you what we think we're going to do. We've actually had a fascinating exchange of emails, which we should just publish. We should just publish them all sequentially <laughs> because a lot of things got discussed. So towards the end of the show, I think we will segue into this um, very long, sprawling, but fascinating cover story in The Atlantic by Scott Stossel uh, about his own anxiety, which is also a book he has out right now. His, his incredible, deep, deep, also sprawling anxiety. Uh, we'll also I think we're going to try to kind of marry that up with a conversation that triggered by something that Irene said, that her students actually don't really identify with magazines. Like a particular name of a magazine doesn't really mean anything to them. Uh, and that got us also sort of thinking about sort of how we brand information because the first thing we're going to be talking about appeared not in a magazine but at a, on a magazine-like website started by a former magazine publisher. It's called XO Jane, and it really did on the internet this week cause this incredible firestorm. It's just a, an essay that uh, kicked a lot of different trip wires, and I will try to summarize it. It's uh, written by a woman named Jen Karen. Uh, she is a self-described skinny white woman. Uh, she describes an episode in a yoga class that she attends regularly where a newcomer to the class, a plus-sized African-American woman, uh, is on the mat, mat right in front of her. And, and, and this woman is not really able to do the yoga routine that's being done there. She kind of has to give up kind of quickly and kind of scrunch down on the mat. Uh, we, we, this is not an un, to, uh, terribly uncommon thing in, in yoga classes. People show up and they just sort of can't or don't want to do it and they – go into sometimes what's called child pose. Anyway, Jen Karen then engages in a whole series of projections. She uh, decides that, uh, that first of all, she she's, uh, decides that the woman is resenting her because she's skinny and she can do all these yoga poses. She's also suddenly aware of the fact that although she feels that yoga is this wonderfully egalitarian pastime, there's hardly ever any African-American uh, people in her yoga classes, even though she does New York, I think in Brooklyn or some borough of New York City. Uh, and it just – it's not as diverse as it should be. Um, and her whole yoga practice that day is ruined because she – every time she looks at that woman, she has all these complicated feelings that she's being loathed and maybe she, she, she even deserves to be loathed for various reasons. She concludes, I got home from that class and promptly broke down crying. Yoga, a beloved safe space that has helped me through many dark moments in over six years of practice suddenly felt deeply suspect, knowing fully well that one hour of perhaps self-importantly believing myself to be the deserving target of a racially charged anger is nothing, uh, is largely my own psychological projection, is a drop in the bucket, is the tip of the iceberg in American race relations. I was shaken by it all the, all the same. This, by the way, is a really badly written piece. <laughs> I mean, I, it may really get into some very interesting areas, but even just reading these sentences, you realize that there's some real problems that probably should have been fixed with the writing. But so um, I don't know. I'm going to begin with Irene just because Irene and I have been in a lot of yoga classes together, although I don't go anymore, but she, and she still does. But 
I don't know. Did, yeah. did, did any of this, obviously, a lot of people have objected to this piece and it's just said Jen Karen's doing a lot of very weird projecting. Who knows really what that African-American woman was going through or was thinking. Um, on the other hand, in terms of sort of what yoga is and bodies and race and stuff like that, it's certainly got a conversation going. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I have two, two prongs to my reaction. One has to do with the race issue and one has to do with being in a yoga class with somebody that's having trouble in it. So, mm-hmm. But I think the reason it became, you know, why did a not that well-written uh, piece in a, in, a, in a site that's not that well-known, at least as far as I know, I had never heard of Exo Jane until, until a couple of days ago. Why did that become so popular? And I think it has to do with this, uh, the, the way this woman sort of unwittingly uh, articulated a, a, a feeling, a, a ridiculous feeling on the part of a certain population of white liberals that's, um, that's, that's that, you know, just the way that she thought she understood everything that this African-American woman that she saw in her class was feeling and thinking and going through. And also she felt she wanted to help her. You know, she just said, I wish I could help her. What could I do? Maybe I could sit and talk with her after class to help her. You know, and it's just it's just incredibly patronizing and condescending. Um, and, but I think the part of the reason why it's it, it, it became viral is because of the idea that it first we love to we love to criticize somebody like that for being patronizing and condescending and it's true but it sort of put its finger on something that a lot of white liberals feel which is well wait a minute there aren't a lot of african american i'm supposed to be yoga supposed to be really inclusive and there aren't a lot of african americans in my class so what am i going to do it's it, it's making me uncomfortable and that's ruining my yoga experience i mean there there's something so deeply wrong with that that it's that it triggers something that i that we can't necessarily even articulate right away i think all right, so those are two good prongs. I, I just I want to piggyback on that and just say that um, you know I have a son who is a person of color and who sees race uh, well in a lot, everywhere basically, but in a lot of places that I don't. And I took him to a yoga class one time years ago, and he, then his first reaction to me was, "Everybody here is white except me," uh, which is something that I hadn't really ever thought about, but it was kind of true uh, at that yoga studio. So. Uh, Carolyn Payne, you're probably just coming from a yoga lattes class or something along those lines. <laughs> Not today. Right. Um, but yeah, I, I looked at this kind of differently because I, I do teach um, yoga lattes, which is a fusion of Pilates and yoga. It's kind of it's it's ridiculous, but it's <laughs> <laughs> it really I, I tried to describe it in an email to everyone saying that it focuses more on uh, when you're doing yoga lattes, it's more of this athletic pursuit. It's it's taking away kind of some of that spiritual aspect and expectation of yoga and making it more of a, a workout setting. So that's what I teach. And I, I, I think that, um, you know, as an instructor, this scared me because it I, when I'm teaching, I do find that I, I wonder, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that everyone is just kind of into their into their moment and enjoying it. And that's and, and to read about this woman having this like crazy inner monologue uh, where she just sounded like a nut job. And it made me think about what these students are, are thinking during class. And of course, my mind jumped to, oh, God, what are they thinking about me? But then I, I thought about how this woman really is not as good at yoga as she claims to be and thinks herself to be, if she's going through this whole inner monologue thinking about this other woman instead of focusing on yoga where, you know, you're supposed to just kind of be in this zen, <laughs> meditative state and here she is just freaking out over someone in class. I found that so ironic. But I, I think the other underlying issue for me as, as an instructor was that uh, that this poor woman was just laying there in child pose in a panic. And why was no, Why was the instructor not on that? If I see someone just curl up in a fetal position in my class, I'm going over there immediately. So there was that issue for me, too. Uh, before we go to Rand, I want to get, give out the phone number. You may have read this piece. You may have participated in the uproar. Uh, if you did or you want to, our number is 860-275-7266. Do call soon because we don't tarry on these topics all that long. 860-275-7266. We've already had a tweet at W. WNPR Colin from Amy, who says, for such a peaceful, mindful practice, yoga is often creating an uproar. I believe this is because humans are involved with it. Anyway, <laughs> the floor is yours, Rand Cooper. Well, three points. First of all, Carolyn's um, penultimate point, that is that there's a strange juxtaposition between the sort of zen-like serenity that yoga is uh, supposed to help you achieve and this woman's chaotic thrashing, internal thrashing about, <laughs> reinforces a suspicion in my mind that this piece is, in fact, a joke. Uh, and its parody 
of, uh, of, of liberal guilt was so extravagant uh, that I, I really three quarters of the way through decided, you know what, this is a brilliant farce, this piece. Um, you don't think people really feel that way, the well, way that she articulated Well, I'm not sure that they express it um, this perfectly. Uh, <laughs> when she moves in, in her self-laceration from the specifics of her, imagine, her imagination of what this woman is thinking about her, um, uh, then she goes on to feel guilt about the entire enterprise of yoga – a South Asian tradition, she writes, that has been shamelessly co-opted by Western culture as a sport for skinny, rich white women like herself. And then, but this is the sentence. But that's that, true. This yeah, is the true. sentence that convinced me that this is a parody. I tried very deliberately to avoid looking at her each time I was in downward dog, but I could feel her hostility just the same. Um, the, the, the the egregiousness of these perceptions. Is so, it's so extravagant that uh, I, I have to. I think, think the most extravagant a, to me was the tastefully tacky sports bra she was wearing. Right. That that line definitely fit. I don't know, but I still I, I, I believe that somebody would 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 want to articulate that feeling. I don't know. I mean, well, it seems like a she lot articulated of, in a way, and this is one of my other two points. I do have a personal. I attended one yoga class in my life, and I was that uh, African American yeah. woman <laughs> um, uh, because I was so miserable being there. Um, but, you know, um, decades ago, Tom, Tom Wolfe wrote his unforgettable essay, Radical Chic, in which he, he sort of definitively skewered the pathology of limousine, limousine liberalism, of, of, of liberal guilt. And it's, it's shocking to see such a – if this is real. It is real. It's shocking to see such a pure recrudescence of, of, of liberal guilt, seemingly unfiltered by all of the backlash against the Brook Guild that has been out there for decades. We get the pure thing. And I mean, just as a sort of point-by-point -point pathology of the contradictions um, of, of, of liberal guilt, you know, it's interesting as a subject by itself. Um, I, I can certainly attest, I hate yoga. Uh, and, and I hate it on many, many points. Um, and uh, I've, I managed to avoid it for most of my life. But about five years ago, I had to go to one yoga class, a beautiful place in Big Sur overlooking the water, where I was, as Woody Allen might say, then ruthlessly tormented for two hours by sadistic instructors. And, you know, I never I never went again. So I, I think I did, what did you call it? Call them the child pose? What, what child happens? Pose. Child pose. That's yeah. when you just sort of collapse. Well, but I think it's because of people like this that people grow to hate yoga. I, I, I think it's fair to say that there's that it's this culture that somehow has now surrounded something that is so wonderful. And it, it makes it, it makes people despise it, feel uncomfortable around it. And, and the body shaming issues alone. I mean, I'm I'm a professional dancer and have taught fitness classes for like a decade. And I was body shamed in a yoga class. <laughs> Like, what, what do you mean you were body – how? In what I, way? You, mean I you had, felt it? Uh, it was a clear – an instructor told me that I couldn't do a pose because I had a, a chest. Mm. She told me, you're having trouble doing that because of your chest. And I was like, oh, boy. Wow. All right. Since I'm having so much trouble, I should probably just leave. I, I literally just wanted to get up and leave. I was so insulted. And it turned out I had nothing to do with that. It's just that I just couldn't do that pose at that time. You know, over practice, I was able to then – do the pose so that instructor was clearly uh you know just but it's that body shaming i i think is part of what ties into well i don't know let, if me, this let me just read a couple of tweets here too also diane is tweeting is it wrong that this conversation makes me want to try the local yoga studio and uh, susan tweets <laughs> maybe she doesn't talking about the author she doesn't live in a diverse area my yoga class is very diverse here in central connecticut i don't know i've been to a lot of yoga classes and they tend to be not very diverse let me just sort of offer my own little observations about this first of all as uh, irene knows I, I had a pretty serious yoga practice for about five years you know three or four classes a week many times in classes with irene um for some of that time, I was also dating the manager of the yoga studio, which allowed me to pull back the curtain a little bit and see what's going on there. And I think you know, there's and a get free free classes. No, no, free, I didn't get free classes. But um, the uh, <laughs> the you know, there's so many things about yoga that are fascinating. One of them is obviously is this kind of crypto religious practice, which people in 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 America embrace mainly as an exercise program. It's also really a a 
you know, I mean, I think it's in its purest form, yoga is a breathing discipline with an exercise problem. You know, I mean, it really is sort of ideally more about breath and less about all the poses you can get into and all the physical stuff that you can do. And it's really been turned by Americans into this weird kind of exercise boot camp that it probably was never really exactly meant to be. But piled on top of that are all these other expectations, some of which are contained in this essay, including that it's somehow or other a refuge, right? You know, you go to yoga for a, to get away from things, to have a safe place, a st- Stillness. At the end, we're all in Shavasana pose, which is the corpse pose where you, you lie and relax. And maybe sometimes uh, a person comes and puts a little, you know, eye pillow <laughs> over your <laughs> eyes or th- you know, things like that happen. And, and, you know, often very nice things happen in that context. But the reality is it's still the world. You know, I've yet to go to a yoga studio that isn't just the world in Lululemon pants. You know, it, it's, it's all, and, and knowing some of the yoga teachers a little bit better, I realized they're all crazy. They're every bit as crazy as I am or as Irene or Carolyn or Rand. But, you know, they're just nuts like the rest of us. And so we have a lot of expectations for what yoga can do for us. But really, you know, except for the fact that it is. Oh, I have one last observation, which is there's a very, very popular site that's maybe run its course now, but it was it had a huge heyday called Stuff White People Like. Does everyone, anybody remember Stuff mm-hmm. White People? Yoga was like no, one of the number one things on Stuff White People Like. So other than the fact that it's a little bit monochromatic, to me, it, it kind of is just like the world and expecting it to be different from the world. Is probably unrealistic. But there is. A, can I just stick up for it too, though? First, yeah. there is a perspective in in inherent in the philosophy of yoga that I think is really useful and interesting. And the problem is people don't necessarily get it, you know. But even with all those feelings of anxiety, I mean, what I've learned from from being in yoga classes is that what you can do with the uh, with the difficulty of being in a pose or with all those thoughts that are going through your mind, is to sort of just let them be there and take it one step away and observe them, you know? And I feel like that writer in that original piece that we're talking about sort of had the idea of that, but she wasn't really standing far enough away, back away from herself to be able to do it. So in that sense, she hasn't really benefited as much as she could have from yoga because I, I feel like no one is... I, I, what I've learned from it is that you're not supposed to not think all those horrible things, but you're supposed to just observe yourself thinking and let it be there, just like you let the, the difficulty be there in the pose. And the other thing is that people feel it becomes competitive. It, you know, it doesn't have to be competitive, but mm-hmm. people think, well, she can put her, her, you know, her whole palm down on the floor when she bends forward. So I'm supposed to do that. And then they contort themselves and injure themselves so that they can do the thing that the person next to them is doing. Whereas if you just say, all right, I'm just going to go as far as I can go, then you can then you can benefit from it. I hmm. agree with what Irene said about it. The, the wonderful thing that I have taken away from from yoga, despite some of my feelings of some of the culture stuff, is that kind of just the sense of just letting it be and just kind of letting yourself go in the moment. And I, I think it's just something wonderful to apply to everything that, that I do. It is kind of though, ironic but, that it turns into a competitive exactly. arena where everybody's looking mm-hmm. at each other. But I think another thing that this piece touches on is, you know, the, yes, I, 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 I actually do. I've gotten a lot out of, out of yoga, too. I don't do it anymore, but I got a lot out of it in all the ways that you described. But it really is this incredibly self-selecting group, and it's not just white people. The number of people who are not college-educated in yoga classes, I, I would imagine, is an incredibly small number. You know, there's a, there's a socioeconomic stratification, too, that, that for some reason or other, pe- the people who don't feel invited into this environment are the people who don't feel invited into a lot of environments. Yeah, for because one thing, it's pretty expensive. Yeah, yeah, fifteen <laughs> yeah. bucks a class or something like that—that's going to knock a few people out right there. This, this is—it's um, interesting that this has become a conversation about yoga. I think anyone reading this piece is, is going to say this. You should probably have a conversation about this woman's attitude. To me, there's nothing. There's no intrinsic relations or connection between the attitude this woman is expressing, which I take to be a portable attitude that she's going to yeah. apply to yeah. almost any situation she finds herself in uh, and, and yoga itself. Um, so, I mean, you know, for me, my problem with yoga, and of course I was exaggerating to say I hate it, it's ridiculous to hate yoga, but <laughs> just to, to pick up on a phrase, colonies, the crypto-religious aspect of it. Uh, I was a, a, a jock for many, many decades, and at a certain point in life, I found many of my friends saying, in effect, this wasn't the overt message, but it was the sort of the, 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 sub, the subtext, you need to move on to a higher form, and, uh, and a higher form of activity is yoga. 
because what you've been doing all your life, all that, that brute, competitive, uh, repetitive using of your muscles to score points and, and hit balls and so on, you know, that really is a, is a, is a retrograde, retrograde kind of activity. Yoga, however, offers you evolution. And, and I, I felt like this is the message. This is the crypto-religious message that I'm getting. And the more I got that message, you know, the more I resisted it. Um, and then when is I finally— it, it was subtle, though, right? No one ever actually explicitly said that to you, And that made right? it worse. <laughs> <laughs> and that made it worse. So then when I finally did get there, you know, in yoga, presumably it was too late for me. I mean, I, all these movements I was supposed to do were excruciatingly painful, not unrelatedly. You see me carrying a cane right now. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, but I think, you know, there's that. Maybe that ties into this effete— over highly educated, you know, sort of sort of uh, um, a profile that you're describing. Well, this young woman does seem like she might be one of Hannah and Marnie's friends on Girls, right? I mean, <laughs> she's got sort of this almost. I can understand why you might have thought it was a humor piece, because it's an exaggerated level uh, of guilt and 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 projection. Um, you know what we should do? We should take a quick break here. We're, we want to come back. We're going to sort of segue from there to Scott Stossel's anxiety piece. But I think we might have a little stop on the way while we, where we talk a little bit about sort of the vehicles for delivering these pieces. Exo Jane and the Atlantic. She says with an evil glee, my yoga teacher hates me. She hates me. All right, we're going to be segueing away from this a little bit and towards something else, although uh, it was observed. One thing that maybe I didn't make clear is how many different responses there were to this Exo Jane piece uh, about being uh, a white woman in a yoga class and being uncomfortable uh, by the plight and possible reaction of uh, a plus-size black woman in the class. Uh, in any case, a b- black woman, an African-American writer for Exo Jane, wrote a scathing rebuke to the writer of this piece. The woman who is the editor who assigned this piece, whose name is Rebecca Carol, who's African-American, who assigned it to this writer, Jen Karen, based on a conversation that they'd had about this experience that Jen Karen described. She wrote a, uh, um, uh, an essay about why she assigned the piece and how she now feels a little bit bad about it. She now realizes as an African-American woman, if she read this piece not knowing Jen Karen, she'd get mad too. And then Carolyn can, uh, led us to uh, another reaction piece that I'll let, let you quickly describe. All right. Um, there was a reaction piece that took this writing style and this scenario and kind of flipped it around. And it was about a African-American woman reacting to a skinny white woman showing up in her twerking class. And it was, I, I know Irene got a kick out of it too. I had sent it around via email and I'm sure Colin will make it accessible for everyone. Yes, I will do my best. Yeah, no, it, it, you know, it's, uh, in, in the short time that this piece has been up online, it has already inca- occasioned at least one parody, that one. Uh, all right, so uh, what we're going to do is kind of segue a little bit over to um, an article that maybe many of you saw. It was the cover story in The Atlantic. Uh, it's by Scott Stossel, who's the editor of The Atlantic. It's about his incredible problems with anxiety, his deep, deep, um, lifelong dating back to early childhood struggles with anxiety, with the drugs he uses for anxiety, with the things that are not drugs that he uses for anxiety. We'll get to that in a second. But, you know, I, I, I'm going to sort of try an awkward little pause here and just say that, you know, as we were getting ready for this and having some conversations, as we do, as we get ready for the news, we sort of fell into this other little conversation that interested me about just sort of the vehicle for delivering these things. So we just talked for 15 or 20 minutes about a piece on something called Exo Jane. Exo Jane is basically a women's magazine site that exists only online, started by Jane Pratt, who used to run Sassy and Jane and other magazines. Um, but it's, you know, it's exclusive, exclusively online. Now, Irene, just by chance it was that you were handing out a piece that you wanted one of your Trinity classes to read – a photocopied piece from Esquire. I'll let you pick up the story from there. <laughs> All right. Uh, and um, so I was I was handing it out, and I said, you know, let's let's think about the the context of this essay that I'm handing out. It's Esquire magazine. So what do you guys know about Esquire magazine? And I was met with blank stares. And these were not first year students either. It was sort of a mixture of, uh, you know, students and. Um, one person said, oh, I think I might have seen that on a newsstand. Yeah, isn't that kind of like Newsweek? And so I thought, wow, I'm living in sort of a different world. I'm living in a world where everybody knows what Esquire magazine is, and my students are not. And Mm -hmm. so I just felt a really strong disconnect right there, and, and it made me think about where they get their information and where what they read and et cetera. And Rand, you had some interesting uh, reactions to this, just in terms of the, sort of the provenance and possible pet- pedigree of where we get certain things. I mean, the Atlantic 
has a stronger resonance for you than, say, Exo Jane. Right. And I know you guys took me down a little bit uh, <laughs> for, for that, but I, I think I emailed back saying, Exo Jane, Exo Jones, what is that, a tattoo? Um, and uh, I, I'm, I'm a, a magazine addict, and my wife has tried to control the number of magazines that come in the house o- over the years, but we typically get about a dozen to 15 magazines. And many of them are in a pile now, actually in a large wicker basket by the side of my bed. Um, I, I'm aware, I read a lot of stuff online, but I'm just sitting here thinking about this, and here's the categorical difference I would make between how I use magazines and how I use online news sources. I, I think of them as as disposable and temporary. I'm happy to and to link. You know, someone will send me something and I'll read it, I'll read the link, I'll link to something else, so I'll do all the, the kinds of linking from one place to another. But somehow, none of the places I land on, I, I think of them as sort of temporary uh, places of excursion, but none of them ever coalesce for me into, into an outlet that I will now depend on and make my own and go to. With magazines, you know, I always read The New Yorker, I read The New York Review of Books, I read The Atlantic, I have a number of magazines, and I will go to them to find out what I want to read and what I want to be thinking about. With, with the web, so far for me, and it's now been years, it's probably never going to happen, I don't use the web that way. I almost use it you know, upside down. I, I read lots of stuff on the web, but it, all from these places that I consider, uh, they're probably temporary, they're not going to be here next year, they're disposable, they're useful for now, they've been thrown together th- three months ago and a year from now they won't exist. And this is what led us to the sort of the larger, the meta themes of, of uh, sort of permanence versus evanescence that, that made for these categories we were discussing in our emails. Yeah, and although uh, Carolyn is not a child, uh, she is in our company a child, or she's the youngest person among us. And I wondered if it was sort of the same for you. I mean, I know you do a lot of work. You're about to start working, I think, on a, on a different website. But uh, you, know, you live a lot of your life digitally, get a lot of your, your material digitally. I'm wondering whether some of these you know, old magazine imprints mean anything to you. Yeah, I haven't bought a magazine in probably 10 years. I, I, I know of, you know. You know of magazines. I know. <laughs> I remember what they looked like. <laughs> so you don't have any subscriptions to any magazines? You know, I get some subs- some things just show up. I'm not really sure how. <laughs> like, there's just some that just show up at your house and you're, you're like, I definitely didn't That's what subscribe. I say about my pornography, too. But, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh. but I I. I I love that the internet, I mean, everything that you cited, you can read on the internet, Ran. I mean, I just, I'll read them online, and then you get even more. And I love that you can read the trashy stuff and the stuff with staying power, and it's all there and it's free. And, you know, and it's eco-friendly. There's no paper printing, and you don't have a wicker basket cluttering up a corner in your house. But it's, it, yeah. Well, it has to inevitably change reading, though, then, because if you're reading something, at least if I'm reading on something online, I'm much more likely to skim and just say, OK, you know, yeah, got it. Move on to the next thing. That's true. And so that's what seems uh, to, to us. And the medium back engineers our attention span. The way. I mean, it's well known that, for instance, with something on YouTube, you've got absolute max eight minutes. That's why they always keep them down to that, because you're not going to hold someone's attention longer than eight minutes. So there is a way in which arguably different delivery systems conduce to and indeed back engineer different attention spans and different kinds of engagement. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I definitely have the digital age attention span. I'm 100% guilty of that. You see, we're trying to have both. <laughs> well, see, and so this is a perfect segue into the Stossel piece, which is, by the standards of many young people, TL semicolon DR. Um, I love that. Yeah. Now. Did you write that up on you the board didn't. today for your students? Uh, uh, no, I, t- I will on Monday. Uh, yeah, it means too long, didn't read. Uh, it's a common um, texting abbreviation and otherwise. Come on, it's long form journalism, yeah. Colin. I guess I we're know. not as young as I'd like to mm-hmm. think and cool because I didn't know what that meant and uh, had to urban dictionary. Well, Colin made that. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> no, no, How no, did no, you no. hear of it, Colin? Have you known this for a while? Yeah, TLDR. TLDR. Like, <laughs> so, well, anyway, let's forget about TLDR. <laughs> let's talk about this docile piece. So, this is an amazing piece. I mean, it really is, first of all, incredibly, it, it is at times has a dark, dark humor to it. Uh, there is a scene where as a journalist, he happens to be inserted into the Kennedy compound because his anxieties, and these are anxieties he describes horrible, horrible anxieties rising up in him from the time he's you know, a very young boy. He's trying to treat them with drugs. A lot of them are centered in his digestive system. He just has a, the way many anxious people do, a very, he has his stomach tied in knots, as they say. And he, uh, so he has a horrible episode in uh, uh, the bathroom of the main Kennedy house in the Hyannis compound. I mean, it's, it seems like a scene out of Woody Allen where he's trying to clean up his own 
sewage. <laughs> and he puts it all in the cupboard and comes back later. <laughs> he, there's another another scene where a therapist is trying to get him over it. One of his deepest, deepest th- f- fears is called emetophobia. He uh, has a fear of vomiting. Uh, a uh, sort of a behavioral therapist wants him to get over it by by vomiting so that he'll realize it's not that terrible. They, After many, many false starts, they give him Ipecac, uh, and he's so afraid of vomiting and so able to control the reflux, the reflex and the reflex, I guess, that he doesn't vomit. He goes through agony, but he doesn't vomit. Uh, so there are these kind of strange uh, little anecdotes interspersed with descriptions of how anxiety is treated these days, whether the drugs work or not. Uh, and, and at the end, he kind of plays what I think of as the Magneto card, where he talks about how maybe his affliction actually makes him superior, or at least people who have anxiety are capable of greater things and less likely to be jerks. So I, I don't even, I mean, there's so much to talk about in this piece, and we've got maximum 10 minutes to do it. <laughs> but uh, so, Rand, I don't know, where do you want to start? Well, I'll just toss two things out there. First of all, I haven't read the whole book, which, by the way, is called My Age of Anxiety, but it was lengthily excerpted in his own magazine, which, you know, takes some chutzpah to put that in your own magazine about what a complete wreck you are. I mean, this, this, this magazine is put together by all the people working for you. But the two things that struck me, one, um, you know, we have lived for a long time now in an era of sort of competitive confessionalism where memoirs are based on your ability to unearth and purvey, you know, really bad things about yourself and your past. And one has grown used to a certain competitive and even self-promoting or self-congratulatory impulse that lies behind this. It's not there in this piece. And I was – and it's all the more startling for, its, for, for, for the lack of it. I mean, he discloses things about himself that, um, you know – He's absolutely not even in the most backhanded way being boastful about, and it's 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 startling. You you read you're reading it and 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 you're thinking I, I can't believe that he actually is willing to 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 come out with this. So that's point one. And to me, it goes back to an earlier kind of confessionalism, going back to say the confessional poetry writing, you know, of the fifties with people of people like uh, like Lowell and 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 Sylvia Plath, where really you know. The sense of dark stuff that we haven't seen that much of is being unearthed for you. The second thing I'd say, for a reader who has his or her own anxieties, and we all have them, we live in an age of anxiety, we have for a long time, it's arguable that anxiety is sort of the defining psychological mode and pathology of our era. Whatever you have, you are a piker and a poker compared to this guy, and you will feel, in comparison, I mean, you may feel some shreds of a, some strands of affinity with him, but mostly I think you'll, you'll feel disbelief that he can actually get through his days as an extremely high-functioning person running a large, major magazine with just saddled and addled by uh, anxiety of a, of a kind and of a pervasiveness that's, that's really just stunning to, to me. Yeah. I mean, my interest in, in it was the, the idea of the cause of it, you know, like the, the, the debate between the Freudian analysis or not, not only Freud, but, you know, anyone who says, you know, look at the childhood, look at his childhood, look at how he was neglected by his parents, look at X, Y and Z versus the pharmacological solutions that are offered. And he sort of examines that. He sort of fights it, even though he's taking an incredible amount of different kinds of drugs. He sort of tries all the different drugs, and he gives these long lists of all the different ones he's tried. Um, but he's kind of the whole time feeling like, well, m- maybe there's a maybe there's another way. So he tries these other ways, and he also tries the drugs. He tries and- yoga. He tries yoga. He's, he's kind of agnostic on on the ultimate. Ultimately, issue, right? yeah, he's he he's kind of he's kind of just asking the question. You know, and right. I so, um, but in a very, very interesting way that I think is useful for anyone. Drugs to read. haven't. I mean, drugs have sporadically worked, but you can't read this and say, "Oh, well, it's just a disease, and you got to take the drugs." Because drugs haven't always worked that well. No, for him, I, I think the piece comes across as pretty much an indictment. Even though he's still taking the drugs, uses some of the drugs to get through the day. I think the piece is a real indictment of drugs. And at one point, when he he cites the uh, the the British Medical Journal study that says that really, you know, most of the antidepressants that are being used to treat anxiety are are not not measurably better than placebos. Um, and that whole section of the piece, I thought, really sort of ripped the whole drug treatment part of this apart. So, Carolyn, uh, you have your own share of anxieties. Uh, I do. You didn't yeah. even want to read this piece I because didn't. it was TLDR and... Uh, <laughs> and I was afraid, as somebody who does have uh, a lot of anxiety, um, I, other than the fact that it was long and that makes me anxious because of the attention issues, but then I get, I, I got anxious about reading about somebody else's anxiety because I, I knew it was going to be so relatable, and I, I did find find it very relatable. I have a lot of quirky anxieties that, you know, I. I 
anything that you can present before me as a, I'll come up with some situation in my head that will cause me to get anxious. I was explaining uh, before we went on air that somebody wanted me to go ice skating and I immediately jumped to the fact that I could fall and trip and, and be down on the ice and somebody would skate over me and chop off my fingers. That's, that's not even an anxiety that people would most, most people would come to. So in reading this, I, I, I actually really quite enjoyed it. I found it, I like reading about other people's anxieties because it makes me feel more normal to have these kind of anxieties. Mm -hmm. And I also like that he did kind of come to this no conclusion. And I also uh, related where he said how he thinks the anxieties are kind of what gives him power. I think that my anxieties kind of is what led me to turn to humor and kind of made me who I am as, as a performer. The uh, so much to say about this, uh, and by the way, our number eight six zero two seven five seven two six six eight six zero two seven five seven two six six. Yeah, that's one of the. I, I also wondered about whether or not he's actually also tapping into something that's going on right now. In some ways, the symbol of say the early nineteen nineties, although I may not have the date on this exactly right, was Tony Soprano, a mobster on um, antidepressants, right? And Tony Soprano, mafia guy taking Prozac, um, and you know today I, and and. and and the fact that everybody you knew was on Prozac was, you know, very much the conversation in the 1990s. And and I'm not alone in thinking this, and it's a little bit borrowed from Stephen Metcalf at Culture Gab Fest, but, but I do notice this. I mean, the, the uh, New York Times has a blog section on their – called Anxieties, right? They have a whole yep. Anxieties blog, which invites all kinds of wonderful writers to write about their various anxieties. And, and you know, just – if Orange is the new black, I'm wondering whether anxiety is the new depression too, whether this is sort of – you know, and not, it's not a new thing. I mean – Woody Allen kind of just embodied it in the sort of, you know, say, 60s and 70s. And so but maybe I, anxiety's yeah. back. I think so. I mean, if I think of my students, my students are a lot of times I see them, you know, sort of obsessively looking at their schedules and thinking, OK, what am I going to do now? I'm going to do this and I'm going to study this then and I'm going to do this now. And so there is, uh, you know, much, much more anxiety ever around than lately, don't I, you think? I agree with that. But when I think about Stossel's, Stossel's book, um, to some extent, those anxieties and the steps, including the pharmaceutical ones that we take to cope with them, can be presented and are presented often as sort of unfortunate but inevitable byproducts of a certain kind of high-achieving, uh, very contemporary lifestyle. Oh, the world is screwed up. Well, I am a little bit too. Oh, I'm, I'm living a, you know, this sort of funky, high-driven, dri- creative, urban lifestyle. Of course, anxiety goes along with it. There's a way that it's part of the package. That's not what Stossel's writing about. Stossel's writing about being so afraid of cheese that, <laughs> yeah. you know, you can't go in the room, you know, where cheese is on the table. Tourophobia is the name of that, by the way. Yeah, or, I can't believe it's a, that there's a name for it. Where, I mean, or, the fear or, of cheese? Without you know, what? You can't go in a room where there's cheese without what? Go, what would happen go to Go brand him? some Greer and Patrick's case. <laughs> yeah, Seriously, yeah. he has tourophobia. Really? He With, has without it? then, it, wow. part of the answer to that is then without invoking an even deeper set of uh, anxiety-producing phobias you have because if you see the cheese, you think I might get sick and I have this omatophobia, which is the deep-seated fear of throwing up, even though I haven't thrown up in 27 years, and he recounts the number of days it's <laughs> yeah. been since he threw up, since he hours. last threw up, but he's yeah. been living in mortal fear of it. So as he, his way of coping with these situations, including public speaking, that's one of them, the guy's pretty high-profile journalist, is as he approaches you know, the podium, he's literally quaffing uh, scotch, uh, and little, you know, miniature bottles of vodka, and 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 Xanax. and and swallowing Xanax. So, I mean, this is this is it's so so onerous. You read this book, you think, thank God, that's not me. So it's you're actually saying it's not it's not a version of what we all have. It's something else. Well, but I, I, I think so. I think, I think it, he makes a couple of interesting arguments, philosophical arguments. First of all, this is uh, also a sprawlingly learned piece that cites everybody from Spinoza <laughs> to Darwin to Edmund Wilson to Angela Carter to, as I pointed out in an email, the only piece to, to mention both Thomas Hobbes and John Calvin on the same page mm-hmm. with no apparent awareness of the ultra, uh, other cultural product being evoked by those two mentions. But, you know, there. It does bring up some really <laughs> sort of philosophical. That took me a minute. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's on one page too, Thomas Hobbes and John Calvin. Well, anyway, the um, you know one way of looking at all this is that uh, if you're not incredibly anxious, you're not paying attention. You know that life itself, as Thomas McGuane wrote, is looked directly 
on is unsupportable. Life is frightening. You know, life is existentially frightening. Who are the people who aren't made anxious by life? You know, that's that's sort of one of the questions that Stossel has. And one of the arguments that he has at the end, I love his jet fighter pilot argument. He says that jet fighter pilots uh, don't have anxiety, or at least they, they don't go into the anxiety red zone easily. Uh, and they're also, in his, as far as he can tell, kind of jerks, you know, <laughs> whose wives don't like them because, in fact, they're so incredibly self-confident, so capable of, of ignoring most of the things that would make a reasonable person anxious that they're unbearable. That was his moment of self-congratulation. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, but you, uh, not quite because anything you can say about this, including what Colin just said, sort of corresponds to one or another frame, interpretive framework in which you can try to understand you know, anxiety. And, and, and the one Colin just enunciated is, well, it's a sort of ultimately natural metaphysical response to life and death. And, and you know, the fighter pilot is constitutionally lacks, actually, a certain kind of imagination, the lack of which armors him against the anxiety that we should all be feeling. And Stossel, one after another, sort of goes through these categories mm. and then says pretty clearly, but it's not enough to really explain <laughs> what, what, what I've gone through my whole life. Right. Nothing is enough. <laughs> well, this has to be enough. We have to stop right here. We have some really quick tweets. Let me just read back to magazines. Uh, Ronald Treat's true, true Story, a video game magazine I read profusely in middle and high school. It got me thinking about going into journalism. He did go into journalism. Kevin t- tweets, as someone who suffers from anxiety, I personally like knowing that there are other people who whose brains act unreasonably. Larry tweets, does yoga help people who have anxiety? Answer, yes, unless you're freaking out about the African-American woman on the next mat, uh, and, and so forth and so on. Thank you to all of you who tweeted back at us at WNPR. Colin, let's take the break. Come back with endorsements. Wait a minute. Are there people who are not afraid of throwing up in public? Today's show was produced by Betsy Kaplan and me. Our interns are Jane Ashley, Skylar Magnoli, and Catherine Pikus. Greg Hill tweets for us at WNPR Colin, and Katie Talarski is our executive producer. The part of Bill Curry was played by Hugh Grant. For links, show pages, articles, and photos of the Faith Middleton Show staff and the incontinent pigeon pose, visit our website, WNPR.org. Monday on The Scramble, Colin chats with actor, writer, whatever, Melanie Cantaya. And now, back to Colin. And yeah, Melanie Kintyre is going to be our super guest on the, on the Scramble on Monday. And in fact, she wants to continue something that Rand uh, started up. She's got a memoir out right now, and she wants to talk about that whole question of how accurate people are in their confessional memoirs and whether uh, writers like David Sedaris and Mike Birbiglia should be held to the same standard. Uh, sort of humorous uh, writers should be held to the same standard as uh, some of the memoirists who maybe have fudged some facts in important memoirs. All right. It's time to do um, our endorsements. This is when we tell you about things that you might like, that we know about, that you don't. Uh, Rand, do you want to go first? Sure. Uh, a couple of movies. I was going to speak a bit about the film Her, but you've already done a whole show on it. But I would say if you're sort of cleaning up Oscar-nominated uh, films that you haven't seen, go see Spike Jones's strange futuristic romantic comedy called Her about the love affair between a, a, a man and his operating computer operating system played respectively by Joaquin Phoenix and, um, and uh, Scarlett, Johansson. Scarlett Johansson. Thank you. My two-word review, Annie Howe. But the other, the other film, this week at, at Cine Studio in Trinity, uh, the, it's Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday, I think, the second half of a four-part German series called Generation War. It's a little awkward because the first half played last week, and I don't think there's any way you can recap it. But it is going to be shown on, on PBS sometime in the near future. It will be available on DVD. It's called Generation War, and it's, it was a four-part German television series, about four hours, four hour and a half hours in total. It's sort of German band of brothers, and it, it follows five people, three men and two women, one of them Jewish, through the years of World War II. It's always very interesting to see uh, uh, Germans come to terms again and again. They sort of do it with each generation with the moral ramifications of, of, uh, of World War II and, and of fascism. So it's called Generation War. Actually, in the original in German was called Our Mothers, Our Fathers, and so that's an interesting change in title. But uh, So keep an eye out for that Generation War. It's this week at, at uh, Cine Studio this weekend. 
The first title is better. Yeah. Um, I have two. Uh, one is um, a book uh, in the theme of anxiety. It's called Status Anxiety by Alain de Botton, who's a writer that I like. Some people don't like him because they think it's too po- it's sort of pop philosophy. Uh, but um, but it's philosophy too, and he has he's kind of he, he he has a lot of references and everything. Anyway, the book is about the the ways in which we're anxious about our status in the world, um, and have been historically by Alain de Botton, Status Anxiety. Um, and second, I've just been I've been thinking about Facebook and trying to I always try to think about my Facebook site as a place where I can actually. Uh, be entertaining in some way, you know, uh, and I, I I can never do it. I don't, it doesn't really work out too well, but I'm just thinking about Jacques Lamar's Facebook page, and I think it's so great. Uh, everyone should just, it's just good for a laugh um, on a daily basis almost, and he writes little things and little um, funny things and et cetera. So Jacques Lamar's Facebook page, I'm you're endorsing. You're telling everyone to go onto Jacques' Facebook page. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I got his permission. There's like right. thousands of people on there now. All right. um, My endorsement is uh, to read those fun things online, like XO Jane. Go to those websites and and like my blog, Cheese and Wine. Just I think that that's one of the great developments in journalism is that you get even more freedom of speech and people writing and doing commentary and all this stuff. So I think that that's wonderful. And also I want to um, give a shout out. I'm wearing a T-shirt today from Sugar Plum, Rachel DeCavage. She's a local designer. She uh, has a really big commitment to sustainability and wonderful designs. And you should check her out online and support local shops and local designers. All right. Uh, I've got a few. First of all, I want to uh, do something a little bit unusual, and that is to say happy birthday to somebody. Uh, when I worked at The Current, for 20 years I was full-time at The Current, everybody knew uh, on The Current staff that the best natural writer there was a guy named Owen Canfield. Uh, he read about sports, but he, he that, Malcolm Johnson used to say that was the big problem with Owen. He was the best writer here, but he writes about sports. He wrote these family columns at, at the time of Christmas that became a tradition here in central Connecticut to read Owen Canfield's Christmas morning uh, uh, column. Anyway, Owen, wonderful writer, turning 80 today. Happy birthday, Owen. Uh, Andre Balaz, a wonderful piano player, will be at Japanalia tonight. I'm going to be there to see uh, Andre Balaz. Those of you who heard Kate Callahan sing on our show on Wednesday will want to know that uh, Kate will be, as she often does, performing with Andre. Uh, Japanalia is this wonderful jazz and, and, and other kind of music venue here in Hartford on Whitney Street. Um, drop by for that. Then uh, there's the movie that Rand's talking about at Trinity Cine Studio, but also there this weekend is 12 Years a Slave. I, I really do. If you haven't seen this movie and you want to get ready for the Oscars, go see 12 Years a Slave. I mean, it really is an amazing movie. I think people are a little bit intimidated by it. It is heartbreaking and painful to watch in certain ways, but, you know, you can handle it, right? You're going to be okay. <laughs> uh, and it's it's also just an amazing, amazing movie. And I think it's probably going to win the Oscar for Best Picture. So, um so man up, or whatever it is that they say. You probably can't say that on public radio. Uh, but gird your loins uh, and go see 12 Years a Slave if you haven't already. And also, to get ready for the Oscars, if you're frantically trying to do that, the shorts have arrived at Real Artways. So they have three reels of shorts. I think it's live action, documentary, and animated shorts. So they have all three of them, I think, right now at Real Artways. Uh, so the scheduling is a little complicated. But if once again, it will allow, allow you on Oscar night to have partisan feelings about certain short subjects as opposed to just sort of not listening when the awards are given out. Uh, so anyway, those are my recommendations. Uh, Andre Balaz tonight at, uh, at Japanalia. 12 Years a Slave when you're not seeing Generation War at Trinity City Studio uh, and the shorts at Real Artways. It's getting to be time to go, except I can't see the clock in there. How much time do we actually have? It's 5 up. It's 5 oh, no, That can't be right. Uh, we have about two minutes, two minutes left. So I want to thank everybody who uh, helped out here today. Carolyn Payne. Oh, by the way, I should say that Carolyn's blog, Cheese and wine. The wine is spelled W H I N E. That will help you find it. <laughs> um, uh, and Irene Papoulis from Trinity College and uh, Rand Cooper. Uh, and joining us uh, on Monday is uh, Melanie Kintaya. She is going to join us for the scramble. We have a super guest every Monday who gets to pick the topics. We kind of have reversed the process of public radio. So she'll come on. She'll tell me what topics she wants to talk about. Uh, I have some hints about what those are. So join us for that next week and a whole bunch of great shows. Thanks again to Betsy Wolfie, all of our terrific interns and we'll see you next week let's play us out we have uh, grace and hugh today i'll meet you down on a side across from saint francis past the conservatory up the street from the seminary you know, it's a very, very, very cool place to hang out. Yeah. <laughs> it's cozy, like a Cracker Barrel. 
Yeah, we all be laughing, talking, joking, talking about this and talking about that. And talk about everything as a matter of fact. Oh, yeah. Talk about Torrington, Vernon, Danbury, Waterbury, Oliveberry, Woodbury, hitting on New Britain, Vernon, I already said that one, Avon, Farmington, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm Kyone Wolf, and I'm going to try that Bikram yoga. It's like hot yoga. It's a lot like regular yoga, but with me in it. Come on. Sorry, Betsy.